Hello, neurodivergent foodies. We're here for part two of a video on neurodivergent cooking and in particular executive function in the kitchen. Uh, if you have not seen part one, then go ahead and hop back to that. This is part of a four part series um, and we want to go ahead and start from part one where I introduce the series and talk about figuring out your needs because that's going to apply to all of the next three videos. In this video though, we're going to be focusing on deciding what are we cooking? What are we eating? Um, and we're going to talk a lot here about uh, thinking about recipes, but also, um, you know, if you, if you tend to be more fly by the seat of your pants, we'll address that as well. So I think that there are kind of, in my head, three styles of deciding what to eat. And they overlap for sure. Um, but, you know, the three styles I would call out would be, one um, is kind of, deciding everything in advance, um, starting from scratch and just saying, what do I want to eat and finding a recipe for that. Um, number two would be kind of deciding from what you have. So I would consider this to be, there's probably a range, but for some folks, if you keep a pretty consistent pantry, um, it might be that you're actually not even thinking about shopping, that you always tend to sort of buy the same things and keep your pantry stocked. And so the decision point is more when you're about to make a meal and you decide what you're going to cook from what you have. And then the third style would be tending to decide uh, at the store. So if you're somebody who wants to see what's on sale, see what's in season, um, tends to be more intuitive about things, or maybe you have a mobile um, app where it's fairly easy to look up recipes on the fly, or you're just going to Google in the store, um, that would be the third type. I think for most people, there's probably some overlap. So for example, I tend to go more towards the deciding in advance and like picking out um, a recipe in advance. but. I do it based on ingredients I have remaining. So even though I don't necessarily keep a um, pantry where I can always just decide what I'm going to eat without going to the store, um, I do tend to, you know, see if there's a particular ingredient that's about to expire or something that I have a lot of. I might try to look for things based on that. Um, you know, you might be somebody, again, who like likes to kind of DIY it and look and see what's in season, but then maybe you have a recipe collection on your phone and you're looking for options from there. So you know, overlap however, however you like. Um, but this is where you can kind of come back if you're not sure to those needs and you can say, you know, if you find shopping to be particularly overwhelming or if you tend to struggle with overspending or kind of buying random things that you don't use, I used to have this problem a lot where I'd just be like, oh, that looks delicious and then I had no idea what I was gonna do with it. You know, maybe the, then you wanna tend towards starting from a recipe. Um, if you have a fairly limited selection of things that you like to eat, um, then you may just have a standard shopping list and you keep some key ingredients on hand that you're always just replaced when you're out and you're gonna decide what to eat from, from those ingredients. Um, or if you're somebody who, you know, your needs are to be a little more um, creative and in the moment um, and you wanna be inspired by what's available, then you might tend to wanna just wander around the store and, and start from what's there. But whatever your method, I think it's helpful to have some boundaries in mind um, to avoid that neurodivergent overwhelm that sometimes comes up. So even if you're doing a kind of roulette method of just like, you know, maybe you're um, flipping through a cookbook and you're just gonna like pick something that looks good or you're walking through a store to get inspired, um, it still sucks to pick something and then realize it's not really meeting your needs. Um, and if you're somebody who is just looking around for recipes, then you're going to want a starting point. There's millions of recipes out there. So, you know, how are you going to start? Some guideposts that I would start from. Um, so, you know, one thing is just like thinking about, well, how often do you go to the store? How much um, food do you actually need? Uh, how many recipes are you going to want to cook for a um, shopping trip? Do you want to cook most of your meals or... Do you want to eat more convenience foods or things that are sort of simpler that you wouldn't you wouldn't need a recipe for something um, like I'm gonna have a bowl of oatmeal or bowl of rice or something like that. Um, some you know are you gonna be like mix and matching um, you know simpler foods where you don't really have to think about what you're doing or are you gonna tend to want to actually like cook a bunch of complex recipes? You know what does that kind of balance look like? Um, sometimes I forget that that like uh, I'm not planning that everything I eat is something that I cooked. I also have some stuff that I want to eat that's pre-done, and so I want to think about that volume. Um, you might have particular nutritional needs that you need to meet or particular styles of meals that you are 
looking for as a starting point. So if you need, you know, work lunches, if you need um, workout snacks, if you need um, family dinners, uh, or school lunches, or maybe it's more like um, you know that you your diet needs to contain a lot of protein or that you're trying to limit your sugar or something like that, um, that's a good starting point. And then the next layer is, okay, so, you know, now that we, we've got the basic uh, foundation of like how much food and what are the kind of categories of food we're looking for, then it's like, okay, well, you know, where are we going to start? Um, are there ingredients that you have on hand that you need to use up? Um, maybe you have a, a wish list of recipes that you've been wanting to try, or you have a particular cookbook that you've just been wanting to explore. Um, have you been having any cravings lately and something that you would like to make? Um, or maybe there's a seasonal ingredient. You know that like peaches are in season right now, so I'd love to make something with peaches. Um, whatever those, those things are as a starting point, you know, those are some ideas um, that just sort of give you some like basic like starting search terms and a goal that you kind of have in mind. You know, I'm trying to find three work lunches and I would love it if I could find you know, some sort of dessert with peaches or what have you. So assuming that you're not somebody who does this totally intuitively in the store, um, and we'll, we'll get to that, but if you're not, if you're not that level of um, just doing it on the fly, then depending on how your spoons operate and how consistent your tastes tend to be, um, it could be helpful to do this kind of deciding uh, in a, you know, thinking about um, recipes and things you like to eat it could be actually be helpful to do some deciding in a big batch where you're building a recipe collection that you tend to look from, you know, when I need my three lunches, I'm looking at my recipe collection instead of the entire internet, for example, or you might actually prefer to look up recipes every week. You maybe don't want to deal with having a big recipe collection and it's just, you know, whatever I'm feeling like now, I'm going to see if there's a recipe for it. Uh, don't really bother to save things. You might combine those two methods, of course. You know, personally, um, I tend to divide it up, so I, I, my, like, I like to, um, I get too overwhelmed if I'm both trying to evaluate recipes for whether they're really the right thing for me and my neurotype and whether it's something I should be cooking, and then also thinking about, like, meal planning for a specific week and what I'm needing. I don't want to have to do that all at once. Um, I'll just get, you know, too tired and I'll give up on the process. So what I like to do is sometimes, you know, I might go through like a single blog or a cookbook that I'm interested in, or maybe I have a family recipe, you know, collection that I inherited. And I would spend some time with that source, um, going through recipes and deciding like what I want to go into my collection. And then I'll use the collection as my usual starting point when I'm looking to see, you know, in the next two weeks, what am I eating? I'm going to start from there. But it might be that sometimes um, I want something specific in a particular week, a particular two week period or what have you, and then I'll cast a wider net. So there's a particular ingredient I want to use and I only really have one recipe in my collection that uses that ingredient. Um, and I look at it and go, I don't really want to make that. Or um, maybe there's something very specific that I'm looking for that I don't have a recipe for, then, then I would just um, go ahead and do some general searching. One thing that I noticed for myself, and if you are somebody who tends to save recipes and have a big list of things that you might want to cook at some point, if you're bookmarking things in your browser, if you have a huge cookbook collection, I noticed that with my ADHD impulsiveness that I would have so many recipes that I would save for later, um, but it became... I had so many recipes that I wanted to try and then it became functionally useless and meaningless um, because every time I wanted to, you know, cook something for the week and I would go to this collection, I would be really overwhelmed and then I was having to ask myself all these questions in the moment of like, you know, do I feel like making this? Are the ingredients available right now? Um, and that tended to get exhausting for me. I realized that it was easy for me to, easier for me to do that work in advance and to make sure that my collection is pretty tight um, and only includes things that I like really am going to want to cook um, as a starting point so that when I'm deciding what I want this week, I don't have to ask all those questions. I'm just asking what is my current need. I was also only hitting but maybe a 50% success rate over whether the food was actually good. <laughs> um, and I had a lot of weird leftover ingredients or like kitchen tools that I bought for one thing that I never used again. Um, I found that I was 
actually not retrying things that I loved. So like I was always looking to this like collection for a new recipe, but I actually did, never remade things that I had really liked. And I kept falling back on eating just like random snacks or things that were easy. Um, the way I eat, like I, don't, I know a lot of neurotypical people like look at me really funny because I don't know if it's an autistic thing or what have you, but it's really easy for me to just, I don't usually do meals like with multiple components. It's easy for me to just eat a thing, like eat some rice or eat some spinach or something. Um, and so it's really easy for me to, you know, think, oh, do I wanna cook? Well, you know, brain cannot pick a recipe. Instead, I will just eat granola all day, every day, or I will just eat, um, you know, rice. And, um, and then I was never cooking these recipes that I was interested in. And so I started getting really selective about my sort of core collection. There are a couple of tools if you are looking to build a collection or just to make search easier. There are a couple of um, tools that I would consider. So one is sort of around where to find recipes. Obviously you could just Google, um, you know, cherry pie or something, um, you know, vegan casserole, uh, but you're gonna get inconsistent results. And I, I do that a lot and sometimes I land on a gem, but often I land on something that was not that good. So you might find that as you go, if certain, you know, cookbook authors, bloggers, um, et cetera, uh, are tending to write recipes in a way you understand, or you've had success executing their recipes, or you tend to get tempted by a lot of their stuff, um, then you might wanna keep, just as a tool for yourself, a little list of these are my go-to um, places. You might wanna do like what I do and go one at a time and sort of start to build your collection. Um, or even if you're just looking on the fly, you might just know, I always check these like five locations um, as, a, as a starting point, because they tend to be pretty reliable. The second tool that I really like um, is a recipe database. So there's all sorts of versions of this, and there's certainly a lot of tools that are not dedicated recipe databases that you can use. Um, you know, some people use Evernote, some people use um, Notion, you know, other like kind of general database tools. But uh, I like using a dedicated recipe tool. So the one I use now, this is not sponsored, but it's uh, Paprika, what is it just called Paprika? Yeah, Paprika Recipe Manager 3. Um, for, for Mac um, and, and Android. I'm sure it's other devices as well, but that's what I have is Mac and Android. Um, I did use Yummy Soup for a long time as well. I was pretty happy with that. Um, but there are tons and tons, you know, check the devices you have and what you're looking for and the prices and everything. Um, a recipe database tools. And often you can get them as a one-time purchase. It's not a subscription. Um, you can look and see, you know, what is it that you need? A lot of them have all sorts of things built in like a calendar, tool for meal planning or a shopping list. So just, you know, see what you need. Um, but I have found that having one of those is useful for me because especially in the context of what we're talking about, because it's really useful for tagging things. Um, and so you can, you know, put in custom tags and categories um, so that it's, it's really easy to, you know, search through and find what you're looking for. You can search often by ingredient, um, and you can keep track of what you liked, what you want to repeat. Um, so, you know, I, for my um, database, you know, I have, I will often like tag things and then search within the tags. Uh, I will include photos, you know, including photos of your actual, like as opposed to the one on the blog or whatever, take a photo of what you made so you'll remember it better often if you, you know, can associate it with the actual thing that you made. Um, be like, oh yeah, it's, it's, it looks like this, not like that photo. Um, but that's also just helpful for memory. You can put in your personal notes about how the recipe went, things you would change, you know, different scale, um, substitutions that you would make. I like a lot of these have like a web clipping tool. So it's really fast. If you have something online that you like, you can just be like, import that recipe and it finds all the parts of the recipe on its own. But you could also just type up things from cookbooks. Um, you know, I use a whole range of tags. Um, I've actually found though that tagging things like, this is a breakfast, it was not as useful for me as things like um, particular dietary needs, particular things related to my function, spoons, um, focus, you know, uh, I'll get into some of those specifics in a little bit, but um, that's more how I use it. I, I also have started using um, a tag for like 
a very narrow list of my kind of standbys. And I have a tag for things that are what I call pantry only, which are the recipes um, mentioned earlier. You know, one way you might do things is that you keep certain things on hand and you tend to go from that. I don't use that as my main thing, but I do like to have a particular tag that's like, here are things I probably don't have to go shopping for, especially if I get towards the end of the week, week and realize, oh, I'm out of things. Um, what can I cook on the fly? So we're going to talk next about like, how do you decide what makes the cut? If you're going through a cookbook, if you're going through a recipe, um, database, if you're going through a blog, whatever it is, you know, how are you deciding what goes in your collection? Um, or how are you deciding if you don't want to save a collection, you know, how are you deciding for right now what you want to make? So I do think back to that needs video, you know, think about your current pain points and don't worry about the rest. You know, what are the things that you, you care the most about? But some things that you might want to pay attention to, you know, does the recipe look appealing to cook or just appealing to eat? Um, does it require equipment that maybe you don't have? Does it have seasonal ingredients? Um, does it require expensive or specialty ingredients that you can't find at your usual store? Uh, if there is an unusual or perishable ingredient in the recipe, are you going to use it all? So either is, if it's something perishable, you have to think about, you know, does it actually use the whole container or do I need to think of like multiple recipes every time um, I, I do this one because I'm going to have to open a bottle. Um, or if it's like just an unusual ingredient, it might be shelf stable, but like, do you want to buy something that you only have one recipe that you would use it in? Um, you, know, you may or may not. Uh, or on the flip side, is it, is it a recipe that uses a lot of ingredients that you tend to have on hand? That might be something on the plus side. How long will it take? Um, like active time as well as passive time. Uh, how complex is the recipe? Is it going to overwhelm your, your brain? Does it have a ton of steps? Um, does it use a ton of dishes? Uh, is it, there a particular spoon heavy technique for you? Can you take shortcuts with this recipe? So these are the kinds of questions you might, might think about. Um, I personally like to have kind of global boundaries in mind. So I, th I think about these questions um, and some of these questions matter to me and some of them don't, right? Um, it might be that like you don't actually have many challenges with physical spoons, so that's not a thing. Or you like washing dishes, that's meditative for you. Or you have a dishwasher, then you may not care. I don't have a dishwasher and I really look out for, for dishes in terms of um, what I'm choosing. So, you know, I have sort of my own personal boundaries in mind whenever I'm choosing things and having those guardrails I find for neurodivergent brain is really helpful. And when I've worked with clients who are neurodivergent, just having guardrails is really nice to be able to just say, I do not do that. So, um, for example, for myself, you know, I don't save any recipes that are going to involve specialty equipment. Um, that I don't have to buy something special for unless I'm really like, I'm going to be making ice cream and I'm going to get an ice cream maker and I'm going to find 10 ice cream recipes. Otherwise, I'm not getting specialty equipment. I'm not going to include things that have foods that I am not eating right now. Um, I used to like hang on to a lot of non-vegan recipes in case I became not vegan. But I'm like, why, why would I do? No, we're not doing that. It's fine. Um, there will still be recipes in the world that aren't vegan if that ever happens. But also I don't like the idea, you know, I like being vegan. I don't want to like hold on to this future that I'm not even like wanting. Um, you know, if ingredients are going to be a pain in the ass to obtain, I just don't really save those recipes anymore. I used to save all sorts of interesting recipes and I just decided, you know what, I can eat those maybe in a restaurant sometime, but um, it's, it's too much of a burden for me personally to go to specialty stores. I just don't have as much access to transportation. Um, if there's a technique in something that I'm always going to hate, you know, I, I've gotten to the point where there are certain techniques that I have just decided I'm never doing again. So I did a recipe recently um, where I had to get pulp out of a squash and it was just so frustrating effort wise. And then it was just a sensory nightmare that I'm like, you know what, if the recipe says remove the pulp from a squash, we're not ever doing that recipe. Um, on the other hand, I also hate grating carrots, but you can get pre-grated carrots and you can use a food processor. So, you know, you can keep in mind, like there might be things that you don't like to do one way, but um, if you have a food processor, you can probably chop things with that or you can buy pre-chopped, um, etc. Another example, I don't have a powerful enough blender to get like a really smooth liquid. And so depending on the recipe, if the texture is going to matter, um, if it's supposed to be like super thin, like a soup or something, um, then I tend to skip those recipes. If it's chunkier like a dip, I don't care, but um, 
you know, if it's going to bother me texturally, then I'm just going to skip that. I know that like uh, another example of a technique that I don't really like is like rolling things out on a counter. I do have good counters for that now, but it means that I have to clean the counter in advance and then I'm going to get flour all over the counter and I'm just like, nope. Um, similarly, like I'm wary of techniques that are going to get everything sticky or messy. I'm just like, we're not doing that or dye everything a, a particular color. Like I don't really cook with beets, for example. Um, I, you know, try to avoid just like buying ingredients that are going to stress me out. So um, if it's something like I, I said, that's like perishable where you have to open it, like, um, you know, I want to think about like, okay, am I going to use this again? And so there are some things that I will buy. Um, some examples of like, um, I have recipes where like I have to open a can of tomato paste or miso um, or like a bottle of just egg. And I'm comfortable with all those things, but if I'm going to use that, I'll save that to my recipe collection. But when I'm doing my planning for the week, I'll make sure, okay, how much just egg are we using? Let's make sure there's enough recipes to cover that bottle because that bottle lasts a week. Um, for example, veggie broth. I always have a thing of veggie broth. It's open. I recently realized like <laughs> that xanthan gum is a really random, but it's a thickener. It's used in really tiny amounts, and so I'm wary of buying that because I'm like, if I'm not going to do 40 recipes with xanthan gum, I'm never going to use this whole bag. Um, and sometimes, you know, a recipe will look tough and look complex, but I can quickly identify in my head, like, oh, I can totally sub out frozen veg for that, something canned, you know, something that takes a long time to cook, like maybe it's beans. I'll be like, great, I can use canned beans. I'm fine with that. Um, but, you know, I kind of know like what I, I will substitute and what tastes okay and what I don't really want to substitute. And so certain things I'll just not bother. Personally, I tend to avoid anything that takes multiple pots and pans, like more than two and we're not doing it. Uh, or recipes that have like a ton of ingredients or a ton of steps. You know, I love like a bowl, like one of those bowl, like a Buddha bowl or something where you have like multiple like you know, pre like like fancy spiced this and marinated that. Those are great. And I and I at one point like got a bunch. I had a book called Vegan Bowl Attack. If you like vegan bowls, it's a good book, but I just realized that like you have to make seven things. And I'm not somebody who does a batch on a day. If I was, that would be perfect. You'd, you know, make all the components and then just eat those bowls for a while. But that's not me, and so I'm just not gonna do that. Um, if it has a ton of steps, I tend to just like never make it, even though I bought the ingredients, my brain just goes, nope. Uh, also, I, I tend to avoid recipes that only make like a couple of servings if I can't scale them up because it's just not, if it's like not worth the money and the time. Another thing that I would recommend, if you're somebody who like tends to really think about money and the cost of things, now obviously, you know, you might have a limited budget. That's a totally different thing. But if you have a, a decent amount of budget, but you tend to just like your brain always goes, and I think a lot of autistic people probably do this where it's like, cheaper is better. So, you know, you're always trying to like use as little of your budget as possible. One thing I try to remind myself is that I want to actually treat myself with the home cooked stuff because if I don't, then I'll tend to just like eat out a lot because I'm not excited about what I bought. And so I ask myself when I'm looking through recipes, you know, am I going to look forward to eating this? Am I excited to eat this? Um, and that's just helpful if you tend to underspend on groceries like relative to your budget. Um, then think to yourself, you know, like, is this going to, to delight me and excite me? Um, or just be, you know, fun, good to eat. Um, I'll also acknowledge that for some folks who have really restrictive diets and are, have food needs that are um, really like limited, that sometimes it's hard to find things that are exciting. And for some neurotypes, it may just be that like food is not a particular exciting experience and that's okay. Like, obviously you know what you need. Um, if you're in a lot of autistic people, you know, have very, limited amount um, number of foods that they like to eat and that's great probably you're not going to need this video as much if you have you know three or four things that you just always eat but um if you are i like it i see you i have safe foods as well so um you know these boundaries can also come into play uh, if you are a little more DIY and you just kind of have them in your head when you're looking around and maybe can help you to avoid getting kind of lost in the store. Um, so if you see something and you're like, oh, it's in season or on sale, but then you think about preparing it and you're like, oh, I don't want to do that. Then like, you know, that'll help you kind of navigate. 
So if you are keeping a collection, um, you know, I like to tag, like I said, in my database, like in information that's important to me and that will make it easier to filter. So I, I said I'd give you some examples. Um, I might tag by season. So things that are like only really cookable in the spring so that I can filter them out when it's not the spring. Um, I, I actually tag by uh, cold and warm weather because I find that if it's really hot, I don't want to use the, the oven. Um, but if it's really cold, I want to use the oven. <laughs> so that's one way to do it. Um, you could tag by purposes, you know, like this is good work lunches, good gem food, you know, so that when you are thinking about a particular week, you can just go to that label and find something in there. Um, you might want to tag by things. These are particularly quick and easy or low spoons recipes. These are particularly cheap. These are one pot meals, you know, whatever it is. Um, like I said, I do the pantry only tag for myself. Personally, in addition to those kind of global limits of things I never cook, I also have, and I tag this, kind of a special occasion level as well as a day-to-day. -day. So I will spend a little more time, use more dishes, and get somewhat more expensive ingredients or maybe ingredients that are harder to find or um, things that I shouldn't eat a ton of for like a special treat. So I do have some things that are tagged special occasion and they're more co complicated recipes. Um, and that way I just don't normally look at that tag, but you know, I can sometimes. Or you might you might want to do like, I do one special occasion recipe a month and then the rest is is not. Generally you wouldn't have to tag if you're if you're marking off when you cook things. This would be automatic, but um, you know, sometimes I also like to sort by like, is it something that I haven't tried yet? Maybe I'm looking to try one new recipe a month, but otherwise I want to pick things I already know work. One of the, the biggest lessons that I personally have learned over the years is that I was focusing so much on what I wanted to eat, especially when I looked at these big, beautiful, colorful photos and um, cookbooks and, and blogs. And I had to remind myself that a super complex recipe is just probably never gonna happen for me. And so just because it's possible and I am physically capable of making it if I really tried, it doesn't mean it's practical. Um, I try to remember that I can always get some of those more complex or fancy foods, either like processed, pre-made or in a restaurant. So things like the Buddha bowls, for example, you know, I can buy that. I can buy, you know, um, like if it's, you know, Chinese food and it requires particular um, ingredients or Thai food, it's like I can probably get that. Um, or if I really liked that, like for a while, I kept like oyster sauce and some other things, vegetarian oyster sauce and black bean. And I was cooking a lot of um, East Asian cuisine. And so that made sense. But uh, another thing I noticed is that I would get really caught on the visual and then not really think about how the ingredients might taste. So this may seem obvious, but you know, I, let me know in the comments if you're out there. I have this problem sometimes where I don't actually like think that hard about what would it be like to put X, Y, and Z in my mouth? Um, because it's so beautiful and I'm just like, so it's like the kind of thing, like I might order it on a restaurant menu, but like, if I really think about it, I'm like, oh, that's a weird combination. Um, so if I feel skeptical about a flavor combination or particular texture and I'm like, well, they say this can get creamy, but I don't know. Um, I'm going to tend to avoid that. Y you might be more adventurous. Um, but you know, I've been cooking long enough that I've just learned uh, often that when I don't trust myself, because I have tried a lot of techniques. And so when I read a technique and I think they must know something I don't, like that doesn't make sense that that would work, but like maybe, you know, uh, or maybe those flavors work well together. Like often I was right. Um, not always, sometimes I get surprised, but like I don't necessarily want to play roulette with like whether something's gonna work um, for my day-to-day -day cooking. And if you're not very familiar with cooking, you know, I would recommend avoiding recipes that like look great, but they're not describing the process clearly, especially like for autistic folks. I think this is one where it's like really hard for us sometimes to be like, what the hell is that term me? Like I, now I gotta Google that. Um, so the process isn't clearly described. If um, you know, you might wanna look for ones that have step-by-step -step photos. If there's a lot of things like to taste or until it seems done type instructions and you're not very experienced cook, then those might be a little bit harder because what does it mean until it seems done? Uh, or if there are ingredients in there that you've never tasted before, you might want to just avoid that um, in case you end up hating the thing. You're also totally allowed to remove things and substitute things. This is one of those things that's obvious, but I often forget, um, you know, 
you can also pick part of a recipe to make, you know, if it's like, this looks good, but the sauce, and eh, like, you know, you could make the thing with a different sauce. Um, my rule of thumb in general is to kind of consider if the thing in the recipe that I don't like or don't want to deal with, is it key to the recipe? So if I take it out, is it going to really change the like fundamental, um, aspect of the dish? Uh, is it going to mess with the flavors a lot? So like, or the chemistry of the thing. So for example, I know some folks are going to cringe. My, my, especially my BIPOC friends. I know, I know. Cause I am like the whitest person when it comes to this. Um, if there's chilies in a recipe, I just don't include them. I know, I know, I know it's terrible, but I just don't, I just don't even look at the word chili. I'm like, well, nope. Uh, I might put like a little like squirt of sriracha or hot sauce or something, but like, I'm not going to buy fresh chilies and make them, uh, and so like that sometimes works, but if spice is the main flavor, then I'm, then I'm gonna be like, I just probably don't want that recipe. Or if the spice is really counterbalancing something else, it might be that it get, it's really sweet if you don't have the spice. So you might have to think like, maybe I add something tangy instead of spicy. Um, if that's difficult intuitively, you might wanna do less um, substitution there. Another the example of like the, the chemical thing or the like textural thing is I can substitute flax for a lot of recipes that call for eggs but if eggs are a big part of the texture or like if it's like whipping egg whites then that's not going to work um you can use aquafaba but you know there's certain things like for for vegan or gluten-free that that you really are not going to get the same thing so um you know I keep that in mind I usually personally like to buy pre-chopped and or frozen produce um, but sometimes the actual shape matters in terms of even cooking, because if things are all different shapes, then you're going to have issues with the, with the cooking. Um, and so like, that's worth keeping in mind. Um, also, if a recipe has very few ingredients that might be, or especially if they're not like as cooked, that's probably a time where you need higher quality. So if it's a stew where you're throwing everything in a pot, um, then the quality might not matter as much. But for example, fresh basil will elevate the hell out of a dish. You know, I used to like look askance when I was in my early 20s at the cost of fresh herbs, but man, like they are too expensive but, and they're cheaper to grow. But whew, like fresh basil, that'll make your, your dish sing. So like sometimes, you know, it's really worth it. Um, sometimes you might want to use fresh lemon juice as opposed to bottled lemon juice uh, if lemon is like a big part of the flavor um but you know if it's like a dried spice blend and there's like seven spices and I don't have one of them I'll just skip it it's usually okay uh, I don't have a very I'm not great at tasting actually so if you are like a super taster or somebody who can really taste nuance then you you maybe can't get away with that but I sure can um just keep in mind that substitutions can be riskier in recipes that don't have a really clear description of what like done looks like so for example if you're substituting out a thickening agent in a sauce, but you don't know like how thick it's supposed to be, that might be a little risky. If it's just like, do it for five minutes, well, it might have changed the chemistry. Um, if you're baking, especially like, uh, you know, if you're like baking like a dark cake um, that's gooey and so you can't test it and it's just like, do it for 45 minutes, you're like, I don't know what it's supposed to look like when it's finished, you wanna be careful. Um, if you know you're always going to make a substitution, then like in your recipe database, just go ahead and make the substitution um, so that you'll remember. And of course, the more you cook, the more you'll notice. So if you're not sure, you know, about anything I'm talking about, but especially this kind of, um, you know, what you like, what you like to, what, what makes sense to cook, what is onerous and annoying, um, just like observe over time and like jot a little note, you know, um, of things that you notice as you go and you might change these boundaries and, and ideas. You might also just shift your priorities or needs. Um, you know, I've shifted my style a lot from choosing, um, you know, what I've been doing for a while is uh, keeping more things in my pantry. I will say I've never done grit. Like I've never found that it really makes sense to keep like a super stock. I know some people advocate like a super stocked pantry. Um, so you can just shop in your kitchen and it's like, you're almost always gonna run out of, or have ingredients and expire when you do that. Um, but I have for a while been keeping a fairly stocked pantry and I tend to just decide what I'm gonna cook based on whatever is expiring. It's like, now we're making a bunch of cashew things. Um, and so that, that can work, but I've shifted from 
that to more intentionally selecting recipes that have similar ingredients. So I'm in the middle of a transition to having actually a pretty limited list of things that I'm going to cook and then a limited pantry so that I always know that as long as I have my pantry stocked, like there's a lot of stuff that I can cook um, and I'm going to always be on the lookout for like, oh, here's a recipe that's like mostly stuff I have in my pantry and then maybe like a perishable thing or two, like, you know, a, a produce item or something um, that I add in. That's going to be a great recipe for my collection. So you're allowed to shift, um, for sure. So once you have a collection or you decided not to have a collection, you're just doing it on the fly, a couple things about, um, and then we're, we are finally going to wrap, this is the longest one, by the way, but we're going to wrap this video in a second, but a um, couple of quick things on deciding before your shopping trip, you know, what you're going to do for like this period of time. Um, so. Of course, if you're doing this more on the fly, more in the moment, then all the tips I just mentioned around like your boundaries and such, you're going to search for, your, for um, things, you know, from the list of, of websites and, and cookbooks you like, you're going to keep your boundaries in mind, um, or you're going to look from your recipe collection. You may, as a, another digital tool that could be helpful, you may um, find it useful to have like a basic kind of repeating structure that you use for meal planning. So for example, you know, I'm always going to do X number of cooked meals per week. Um, that's what I'm willing to do. You know, I cook two days a week, this day and this day, and there's always one per um, day. Or, you know, I'm going to do, you know, meal planning and I'm going to do all my cooking once a month and I'm going to have like freezer ready recipes and this is how much. Um, I'm going to always like try to have this balance of different types of meals. Um, so, you know, you might have targets, like I mentioned, you know, maybe it's like, your sort of meal planning formula, your repeating structure, is that you're going to try one new recipe a month um, and the rest is from your kind of standby list. Or uh, if you're like, like me <laughs> and you tend to not notice that you're eating the same thing a bunch and you're missing nutrients, like this is a problem. In fact, the last two days I don't think I've eaten a vegetable. Probably four days. I've eaten pancakes and french fries this is real talk, talking about cooking and all this like fancy stuff. Pan I did cook the pancakes, but pancakes and french fries for like three days. I have not had a vegetable, not the best. So if you're like me, um, it could be useful. You know, it, I, as I'm doing this like transition to a different style where I have a shorter list, I'm actually intentionally have like an A list and a B list. Um, and I'm going to start uh, always intentionally picking like um, the A-list is like protein heavy recipes and then this is carb heavy recipes and making sure that at least one of those two has vegetables <laughs> every week. Like that's one, you know, kind of example of like a formula you could give yourself to always say like, make sure you've got this, you know, this plus this. Um, depending on like your neurotype and, and the way you operate, you may want to make very concrete plans about when you're cooking what. So, you know, you decided like, I'm going to shop for the, the next two weeks, I'm going to make these recipes and they're going to happen on these days. Um, that might be really good for you. It might be good structure to have um, and it might motivate you to always know that you do it on the same day. Or if you're more like me, you might need to be a lot more flexible. So, you know, I personally know that I'm going to often be like, oh, I kind of want to make it on Thursday and I don't make it. Or I suddenly am bored and I want to cook and I make something early. So um, personally, I try to make sure that I'm not shopping for multiple recipes that have very perishable ingredients all at the same time. So I'm not going to be like for the next two weeks, everything I'm cooking has really perishable ingredients because I don't do like all the batch cooking. If you do batch cooking, that's going to be easier. Um, but uh, you know, you may, so, so I would, I would start with the most perishable. So I might have like one recipe that involves produce that I really want to use right after I buy it. Um, and so I'll do that one first and then things that are more shelf stable ingredients I'll do later in the week. Um, if you do like the batch cooking, then you may want to intentionally pick things. And this is of course an art all its own. I bet, I bet a lot of neurodivergent people are great at this. Um, you may want to slot things in um, so that you know like, oh, I can reuse a pan. I can prep all my ingredients at once. Um, I could bake things at the same temperature. You know, you may want to like really game out that, um, that thing. You may maybe have some like core key in ingredients, um, you know, a couple of proteins, some vegetables that you're kind of like mixing and matching for your recipes. There are also, of course, are recipes that intentionally use leftovers, like fried rice or what have you. There's so many things for overripe bananas, so you can keep that in mind. Um, 
And then finally, last thing for this video is to keep in mind that you don't have to cook everything. <laughs> so, um, you know, I like to try to incorporate some more minimal options, some like zero prep options. And I always, as a neurodivergent person, like to have emergency go-tos on hand. Um, you know, personally, my neurotype is such that I sometimes really like forget to think outside the box. So I have to remind myself that there's actually a lot I can do without a recipe. Um, for example, like one of my go-tos is frozen rice um, that can be microwaved. I do it with lemon juice, vegan butter, salt, pepper. It's very fast. It's very easy. It's a go-to for me. Um, it's very simple. Uh, and I like, I like the way it tastes and I like the texture. Um, I also like have to remind myself that I can mix and match with things like grains, frozen vegetables, shelf-stable proteins like nuts or certain kinds of tofu, you know, I don't have a, have a big elaborate recipe. I can just be like, I'm gonna have some rice, spinach, and tofu. Um, and sometimes I have to remind myself of that. Uh, you know, I like to keep like canned soup on hand. I like to keep oats on hand, some Trader Joe's frozen meals, um, just stuff for when I don't feel like it. And for me, I am like so explicit with this is I will literally like keep a list of the options um, so that I don't forget that I have soup. So I'll just be like, here's my emergency list of foods you can eat. Now, here's the things you can do if you don't feel like cooking that take 10 minutes. Boom, boom, boom. So that can be useful. Okay, so that was the longest video. That was all about deciding what to eat. We talked a lot about recipes, talked a lot about um, figuring out how your needs kind of relate to the recipes that you're willing to cook. The next couple will be shorter, but in the next video, we will talk about the actual um, process of doing the shopping. So. Uh, leave comments below if you have questions. Um, also, if you're a neuro neurodivergent person, I have a newsletter link below and um, I do a lot of different stuff for neurodivergent folks. Um, so I would love to have you sign up. That's the best place to find out because you know I don't just do YouTube, I also have a blog, I also do um, you know free resources sometimes, I do classes and one-on-one -on -one, um, opportunities. So if you wanna find out about what's going on in my delightfully neurodivergent world. Now, I'd love to have you sign up below, um, but feel free to ask questions or let me know, you know, what's your um, take on some of this stuff? How do you decide what to eat? What's your process look like? Um, I am a nerd about these things. This is my special interest, so I would love to hear about how you do it. And we'll see you hopefully in the next video.